I know, I know. Uh, some people do not like Uncle Ted. And if you're a listener of the show, I totally understand if you want to skip this one. But honestly, this was one of the most fun episodes I've ever done. Ted is just a fountain of energy and he's passionate about a lot of things. And he has great stories to tell, like hanging with Keith Richards at Studio 54. So love him or hate him. Uh, Ted's an interesting guy. He's a successful guy and he's a great guest to have on your show. So my three goals with this episode were one, to promote his new album, Detroit Muscle, comes out soon. Number two, to convince some people who think Ted's a bad guy that he's not so bad because he does a lot of cool charity work. And number three, I was just going to have fun and hopefully not get canceled. And I, I think we succeeded on all that stuff. Plus, Ted plays his guitar. He shoots his bow and arrow for us. It was good times. Enjoy. Well, can you believe, can you believe I actually got this piece of shit to work? How are you doing? <laughs> Good. How are you, Ted? I'm uh, managing a life of frenzied energy and willing to share it with you, which will make a great podcast, by the way. Oh, yeah, I know. I can't wait. It's going to be like a roller coaster. A little bit scary, but really exciting, too. Yeah, let's do it. Start it now. Good. You should have got that. I got it. No, I got it. I'm that recording was a great all of it. exchange. That, yes. The salutations are always the best moments. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I want to start off. I usually end each episode with a charity. I want to start off with a charity because I want to show everybody what a good guy you are. Tell me about all the tr charity work you do. Um, I know one thing is the Ted Nugent Camp for Kids. Well, there's so many. I mean, I'm, I'm almost like Mother Teresa with a Glock. <laughs> um, I'm surprised. I'm surprised my halo can make it through the door jams. <laughs> and that's J-A-M-B-S and J-A-M-Z and J-A-M-S because I'm a creative adventurous guy. I don't go for the road less traveled. I go where there is no road and nobody's ever traveled. Lewis and Clark wouldn't have sent Sacagawea where I was this morning. My point is... <laughs> <laughs> My point is, is that yes. I was raised to be the best that I can be. Yeah. So, you know, I didn't understand what charity work was when I graduated from the uh, American anti-education system. In fact, I was as mushy brain, clueless, dirtbag, know nothing guy that ever walked the earth, like pretty much everybody that graduates from the American anti-education forces. But it wasn't long before, because I've always followed my instincts and my mom and dad forced me it's called parenting 101 discipline mm. be the best that you can be or get your ass kicked boy wouldn't it be wonderful to return to those days <laughs> uh, but anyhow um that effervescence and that positive spirit and attitude is alive and well in the nugent camp and so it was really a a, a sucker punch a, a beautiful um positive sucker punch i think it's 1968 i you know, radio in world of rock and roll, when it was just becoming beyond just hit records, it was getting into deep track FM radio and doing interviews with artists. And I was being the only clean and sober artist on the planet. Um, my brain actually worked and I could form syllables, not to be confused with Joe Biden. And so these guys would always <laughs> ask me, they'd always ask me where I get my energy and my how I got my middle finger to stay on fire like I do. And I'd always share with them, um, soliloquies and experiences in life that the rock and roll radio people and, and even the mainstream media that I started doing as, as early as the late 60s, not my late 60s, the 1960s, um, I would always share with them my passion and my excitability. I don't know if you've noticed, but just since I've come on with you, yes. I'm 73 years old. I'm an excited, passionate, super dangerously alive son of a bitch. And I think that's what God wants us to do with every gift of another day. So it was, it. I was clueless. I all my life revolved around the spirit of the wild, my bow hunting, nature's allure and fascination and lessons of accountability. And, and to simplify that, if you hunt with a bow and arrow, if you have, if you put forth an unaccountable step, there will be no reward because the animals will hear you coming. If you put forth a conscientious step, the great spirit will reward you with close encounters with game. And then if you apply your samurai spirit to being one with God's miraculous creation, the, re the ultimate reward is that you will be one with nature the animals will present a shot and you'll have venison and the ecstasy and the celebration that goes with self-sufficiency. Uh, this is quite an answer, but get ready because this is how <laughs> I answer questions. So I was clueless about anything in life except 
the fascination with wildlife as a bow hunter, the fascination with the electric guitar, thanks to Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley and the Motown Funk Brothers and all this outrageous, unprecedented flurry and fury of new rhythm and blues gone electric rock and roll and girls. So I was focused on the three trifecta of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But we got a phone call at Diversified Management, Nick Karras and, uh, and Dave Leon. I can't remember. I can't believe I remember all these details, but actually when you're clean and sober, you can. And and there was a young man, he was uh, my age, he was 19, and he was dying of cancer. I was clueless of cancer. I, I, I had no idea about terminal illnesses. I was immortal. I was like Bruce Lee with a Gibson. Um, I was uh, cocked, locked, and ready to rock the clock around the clock, Dr. Spock. And the word <laughs> got back to me that this young man was dying. He was terminally ill. And he had heard all my interviews celebrating nature and marksmanship, being clean and sober, um, mark, uh, the, the discipline of trigger control and breathing and, and sniper discipline, firearms training. And I'm the only guy that ever <laughs> espoused and celebrated and promoted that in the rock and roll world or in any media world at that point. And so he was allured, never having hunted, never having fired a gun, that before he died, he wanted to spend a day with Ted Nugent learning about archery and hunting. Well, that, you know, I'm on a high velocity trajectory with Amboy Dukes playing every night and cultivating, practicing, rehearsing, nurturing uncharted guitar territory. And I, and it was like, whoa, the kid's going to die soon. And he wants to meet me before he dies. Well, what the hell did I do to deserve that? What it, it's such an emotional juncture of a young man's life that's he thinks of the guitar player so i was fascinated yeah i want to meet this guy's name was jason i want to meet this yeah guys i set it up uh, meet him in that where's oh he's from up north but meet him in Ann Arbor. can he meet me in ann arbor so i took him out to the uh uh the this federal and state land there uh by the washington uh, county uh game preserves you know wildlife areas and i took my smith and wesson 22 revolver and we went after squirrels i don't even care if the squirrel season was on why there was a season on rodents i'll never understand but um <laughs> I, I took them out and i showed him that the motor city madman this hyper gonzo high velocity flame throwing rock and roll thing could stop take a deep breath and we communicated and in nature which is why my new single is called american campfire because it's around that campfire both literally and figuratively i don't think we in fact we didn't have a campfire we should have but we walked the uh this this the forests and the swamps and the rivers and i sh i showed them how to shoot the 22 trigger control sight acquisition breathing it's a it's a martial arts it's a samurai thing unless you're just plinking which you can plink but first you should probably probably find your spirit in control whether it's bow and arrow or guitar or welding or parenting but the the handgun the double action handgun, you open the cylinder and there's mechanics. And I would go through it slowly. He couldn't believe that this Motor City madman flamethrowing guitar slammer was also the samurai guy. And I remember he would always go, this is, I couldn't have imagined that this was, was what it's going to be like. So I'm, I'm, I'm walking with the guy to guys. I had lost track again, that samurai thing, I had lost track of that he wanted to meet because he's going to be dead soon, which is incomprehensible to a young man on fire. But we had such a good time, and I'm a funny guy. You may have noticed that. I, you can't have <laughs> yes. fun with me. You're weird. So I, we laughed and talked about girls and talked about guitar licks and talked about our favorite songs and our favorite Chuck Berry songs and and growing up in Michigan, the land of Fred Bear, and how he never got into bow hunting, but we, we never got around to bows and arrows, but we, we shot the pistol. We didn't kill a squirrel or anything. We saw a few, but killing a squirrel with a pistol is really tough. And and he, I think he grasped 
why we didn't kill a squirrel because it, the challenge with a handgun is incredible. But I got him where he could knock down some tin cans at 25, 30 yards. And you could tell that all of a sudden, for a moment, he wasn't facing death. He was fascinated with the here and now. So regarding the charity, I realized that I've been um, blessed beyond measure to be invited. And this has happened so many times since that. And little boys and girls, little five and six year old boys and girls. Um, it, it, it so awakens you. It so reaffirms prioritization and intellectual, spiritual considerations of how you relate to people that I guess we can jettison from that time with Jason before he died. And all these people that have asked to spend a day hunting or fishing with me before they die, it's uh, I, I, I manage my emotions real good because you can imagine how emotional it is. Mm -hmm. um, and so to be so touched and chosen. They chose me. How about a little boy, six years old, dying of cancer? What definitive vetting process did his parents have to go through when he asked to go hunting with Ted Newton before he dies to, to determine whether I was a good enough guy to qualify? Well, guess what? I am a good enough guy to qualify. They determined that. And there is no other scrutiny or review more meaningful than that. No, that's an amazing thing that you're doing. And you also give 250 million meals a year to the homeless. Yeah. Yes, I just with my trusty bow and arrow. We kill yeah. a lot of deer, uh, but it's not. I don't. I don't do the the two hundred and fifty million. I I do a bunch, but not yeah. that many. <laughs> but we did create a hunters for the hungry program. Hunters for the hungry. Ago. Yeah, yeah. A so, bunch of sportsmen. So it's now it's nationwide, and we do. I think it's over three hundred million dang. perfect, organic, nutritious, super quality meals of hot nourishing venison to homeless shelters and soup kitchens that's why i'm like i'm like i my halo i can't the believe halo. it fits in the house um but it's not just me yeah. it's it's a whole bunch of really giving caring people which i'm surrounded by all the time but we did do a review here recently i have an assembly line every day i i, I you know nowadays with the middle finger on fire i I literally sit down and I sign thousands of these. It's like an old man's sweatshop. I sign, <laughs> I sign all these hats, and there's some I probably shouldn't show you. Um, <laughs> that and I sign guitars and bows and guns and and butt, butt stocks off of rifles and bullets and and skulls and eight by ten photos and driftwood uh, and and oh. arrows. I sign all. I have my own signature line of arrows that has the ubiquitous zebra graphics and oh, i signed cool. those literally i've been doing it since the 1960s and we have calculated um on the low end that i have raised over 27 million dollars just by signing things and donated to fundraisers for children's militaries law enforcement conservation uh civil rights organizations um, uh, school, uh, music, uh, endeavors, um, archery and school endeavors, uh, uh, Ronald McDonald cancer. I mean, yeah. just name, name something you care about. And if you're here with me today, I can tell that you, everybody I know we care. Of course. And if someone yeah. reaches out, go, will you sign a guitar for this, uh, for this, uh, St. Jude's children's hospital? I go, yeah, how about four of them? Um, so yeah, I, yeah. I I have a heart and I have a soul. And when you're clean and sober all your life, um, your 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 spirit responds appropriately. Absolutely. Which, which well, is, the clean and sober thing you mentioned that a lot. One of my earliest memories of you was an interview on MTV. Is this a true story? Or did I remember this wrong? It was something like you smoked when you were a kid or you drank when you were a kid and your dad made you smoke a pack of cigarettes or drink a bottle of booze. And that was the end of it. That was it. Right. Is that what happened? No, that is a variation of that. Variation. Um, my, my dad would have ripped my head clean off and pounded me if he caught me smoking, even though he smoked. <laughs> 
God bless the, the greatest generation, huh? Uh, but he was a great father. We didn't think so being over disciplined growing up, but we certainly appreciated it later on. And I do every day. And it's how I raise my children and my grandchildren. But no, I, I played at a University of Detroit fraternity party, a pool party. I mean, this was 1958, 59. I was uh, going on 11 years old. And I was already playing Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley stuff. And my band, the Royal High Boys, it was a combo. It was me and a drummer. <laughs> and it wasn't even, there weren't even any hippies. It was beatniks. <laughs> and the beatniks were smoking dope and drinking. And I didn't know what dope was. I just thought it was really a delicious smelling cigarette these guys were smoking. I had no idea, but I didn't dare smoke. My dad would have clobbered me. Um, and I got home a little later than usual as a kid, but my dad sanctioned my mom and dad said if you're going to practice guitar which you have to do every day or you're not going to play guitar um that i came home and they had offered me a couple of paps blue ribbons mm. and i took a few swigs i don't think i drank a whole bottle but i was just a kid um and my dad could smell it on my breath and he, when my dad died a, a number of years ago i went through his boxes of accumulated stuff and there was my pad of paper with, I will never get drunk again, written 1000 times. <laughs> oh, shit. So that was your punishment. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and, and of course, he was really very stern. And when he laid down the law, you know, you better obey that law, which is what I wish my president would do. But um, <laughs> um, if, if I actually had a president. But my point is, is that that discipline goes to the core of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Because if you're not disciplined, you're not going to get any of that stuff. So going back to the charity thing, uh, and again, it's not me. It's it's everybody I know. When it, All my ranching buddies, my farming buddies, my hunting buddies, the law enforcement, the teachers, the people that share my hunting campfires every year, which is a, 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 an army of good Americans, they all give and give and give. And uh, that's, that's just what I do. But I think the glaring um, uh, crowbar of reality that we're facing here, Dave, is that uh, I'm really surrounded by the best loving, I'm sorry, Chuck, uh, the best loving people in the world. And equally as powerful as that, I'm despised by the lowest scum that ever slithered on the earth because they would literally call me a coward for murdering innocent animals as I'm donating nutritious venison to homeless shelters. And that's the culture war in the most ugly graphic you can explain. And I couldn't I couldn't be more proud that I'm that guy. Yeah. Well, and then even the, there's people that disagree with you, but like Tom Morello from Rage Against the Machine, you're still friends with him. You're, Henry sure. Rollins, another guy who, it, you know, raises an eyebrow when he hears you talk, but he also respects that you don't do drugs and that kind of influenced that punk movement. The sure, I would think so. Yeah. And by the way, the punk movement, uh, the, they better get cracking because I was born when Little Richard had a punk movement. Nobody's even come close to Little Richard if you want to be a punk. <laughs> 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 so I, they, the, the masters set the bar when I was born and little Richard, uh, whether it's grunge or, or whatever that movement was, the CBGB is none of them could come close to little Richard. Come on. That guy was awesome. He had such energy. Yes. How about that? And I think I was the closest uh, as a white guy. Try to convince me of that. Um, I came the closest to Little Richard's uh, fire breathing on the opening and the vocals on Wango Tango back in what was that, 79, maybe 1980. Um, so, yeah, he was very inspirational to all vocalists. I don't care if you're Paul Rogers or Steven Tyler or Sammy Hagar, uh, between James Brown and Wilson Pickett and Little Richard, uh, they set the bar and it's never been surpassed. Right. Well, I'm going to get in trouble if I don't promote this new album that you've got, Detroit Muscle. It's a great title, it's an awesome cover art. And the song, Come and Take It. I mean, this song, it's pretty obvious theme, right? This is clearly about trash men uh, coming to take your trash. Is that what it's about? Yeah, ex that's exactly what it is. It's actually, <laughs> I sent it to the ultimate garbage collectors, uh, Joe Biden and Beto O'Rourke. Um, <laughs> and I sent them a copy of my governmental oh, love song, Come and Take It. And I gave them my address. And I said, if oh, you're going to take yeah. away our guns, start with me, punks. Yeah. Well, how many guns do you own? 
Uh, well, yeah, I just had a sale, actually, because I had so many. I mean, can you believe that Ted Nugent is about to make the statement, I had too many guns? <laughs> I mean, shocking. That's that, so wrong. That's the I feel headline so right guilty. there. I feel so guilty saying that. Yeah. But I really did. I had hundreds and hundreds of rifles and shotguns that were collector's items oh. that just sat in the safe. I've never fired them. Some of them I've owned for over 50 years. The beautiful handguns. I kept my favorite hundred, but I sold hundreds and hundreds of guns because it's, I, I'm not a, believe it or not, I'm sitting in a cuckoo's nest. I don't know if you can see this room, but I've got firepower and I got oh, cool. hundreds, hundreds of thousands of rounds of ammo and beautiful dead creatures that fed me. Um, <laughs> but but I, I own I own somewhere around 100 guns and I I have my favorite half dozen that I train with every day and I use for specific uh, duties, uh, long range sniper rifles that I use on occasion when a rancher has too many deer and he calls Uncle Ted to fix it. Um, so I love my firearms. It's, it's a great discipline. It's a great tool that literally is not just uh, fascinating, fun, um, recreating, because when you dedicate yourself to marksmanship and projectile management, it really focuses everything you have to that moment of ignition and the competitive factor i compete with i don't i compete failingly with the, the heroes of delta force and swat teams but I, I hold my own as for a guitar player and i find i find projectile management which happens to be the name of one of my companies projectile management being uh, a manifestation of one's life management and that's the, the origins of zen if you can control the mystical flight of the arrow that can be the control of the path of your life's vision. And that's really what it comes down to, because when I come to full draw, in fact, I do it every day. Um, I just got done shooting a bunch of arrows outside with my dogs. But every day, even right in my man cave cuckoo's nest, I have multiple bows and arrows that I flex and test every day. And I have a mechanical release so that, release so that the uh, arrow comes off consistently. And when you come right about here, there's no Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> Whoa, I heard that. You actually just shot that. Yeah, I got a target range in my man cave cuckoo's nest. That's awesome. Yeah, that's yeah. your man cave? So that's off like the yeah, main? Yeah, it's, it's, it's where I clean my guns and sharpen my knives and play my guitar. By the way, you think that bow and arrow is cool. Um, this is a Gibson Birdland. Yeah, that's, this is that's the one. I can't hear what happened. Yeah. Hey, I have a question. The song Cat Scratch Fever. Yeah. I always wondered this. this. The line, this is a genius line. I made the pussy purr with a stroke of my hand. How did you get that line through the censors? Because when I lived in Seattle, they'd play that on the radio uncensored. And I was like, he just said pussy, but he said it on the radio. How did you do that? You know, I don't write songs. I ejaculate them. I just pick up the guitar. <laughs> it's it's a gift. I just pick up the guitar and these killer licks, and I don't write songs. I, Chuck, I've never sat down and wrote a song. I don't have a pad of paper and a pencil. I pick up the guitar, and those things happen. And being raised on the masters of groove and defiance and soulful <laughs> music, the black heroes that gave us all the best musical foundation in the history of Earth, um, I'm so mesmerized and so genuflecting at their altar that patterns happen and when a pattern happens it in if you're open and again my hunting outdoor lifestyle purifies me the healing powers of nature when i come in my man i just by the way i rushed in here this morning i was skinning a deer and I, my alarm went off and i went well shit i gotta go do the zoom thing <laughs> so i hauled ass got the dogs up and then i get here and oh. wouldn't accept my password so i was about to glock it but mrs newton <laughs> came in and saved me um my point being is that when i'm out there there's no joe biden there's no evil there's no antifa there's no black life matter terrorists there's no arsonist. There's no negativity. There's no hate. There's no lies. When I'm out there, I fixed a, a water crossing fence this morning. I'm, I can't believe I have any fingers left. And so I'm so tuned into the earth that by the time I get back to my 
man cave cuckoo's nest or in Michigan, the sacred swamp barn, guitars and amplifiers. And I immediately plug in and the most emphatic, unambiguous expression of what I experience when I come in from the total purification of the outdoor life. Every time I pick up my guitar, it's like my first piece of ass. It's, it's, <laughs> It's even as this old silver beard, 73.4 year old man, you, you can tell I have a lot of energy because I am. Yeah, it's recreation, but it, the foundation of the term is recreate. So to your question, I love my elongated answers. I, so, I kind of do too, actually. It's like a journey um, to the center of the mind. And so <laughs> when I write that song, I'm, it's, it's got the title. It's got a cat in the title. Yeah. And I didn't think this at the time, but when I played it for Epic Records, everybody, well, you can't say pussy. I go, it's about us. It's about a cat. It's yeah. about an actual disease about cats. You can use the term pussy when you're talking about cats. Everybody <laughs> shut the fuck up and let's record this masterpiece. <laughs> it's literally, Chuck, it's literally out of body. I, you know, in uh, The Last Samurai, when Tom Cruise was trying to figure out the samurai maneuver, it's like a, it's like a bladed ballet. Don't you like the way I termini terminologize things? Bladed like, ballet, that's a new Ted Nugent song, I think. A, bla a ballet of the blade. And the samurai master came up to the white guy and went, too many minds. It must flow instinctually. Well, that's what my guitar is. That's what my lyrics are. That's what my song. I got a song in the new record. Wait, Chuck. Yes. Wait till you hear the song Feedback Grindfire. Two words. Ooh, that's a cool title. What a great title. But it is my, my guitar's feedback and it's grindfire. I mean, no other guitar does it. Awesome. Look at the look at the goosebumps. Oh yeah, I My know. First piece of ass. Um, <laughs> Even well, still to this day, the guitar still electrifies you like that. That's amazing. Yeah, and again because I just came in from, I got dirt in my face. I don't now because I wash my hands, but. I get dirty. I get earthly. What, what's the greatest compliment you can possibly be given? Allow me to answer. Okay. <laughs> the guy, and they say this about my kids all the time. Boy, your son, Toby, I worked with him on that last hunt. Boy, he's really down to earth. He's, a, he's really uh. grounded. Well, what does down to earth and grounded mean? Why would you use those terms to compliment someone's integrity, reliability, um, positive energy? I'll tell you why. Because the more time you spend earthly hunting, fishing, trapping, farming, ranching, digging, planting trees, these hands have planted tens of thousands of trees. Been doing it since 1969. Nobody said, you know, you should probably plant a tree. No, my instinct, my brain, I hunt, I shot a squirrel out of a tree and then I, I burn in the fireplace and my wood burner. I go, my, my spirit went, you know, you're using wood. You should probably replace it. Hmm. Hello. Hello. Um, so, so, <laughs> so if, if you'll never have an interview. I don't know how many interviews you do. I don't know who you talk to and it doesn't really matter. I hope you have a good time and I'm sure you get some fascinating dialogue and I, we should learn something every day, whether you talk to a genius or a dirt bag. I think we learn more from dirt bags than we do geniuses. Um, grounded down to earth. Are you connected to God's miraculous creation in a positive, beneficial way to increase quality of life that can only come from quality air, soil, and water, which can only come from wildlife habitat, but only if the wildlife as a precious renewable resource is valued so that the money, the gazillions of dollars for hunting, fishing, trapping licenses, and the supplies safeguard this vast habitat, enhance marginalized habitat, Ducks Unlimited, Delta Waterfowl, National Wild Turkey Federation, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Pheasant Forever, Whitetails Unlimited, the Trout Society, the Grouse Society. Are you, are you, are you, are you, 
are you cataloging this information? <laughs> I'm recording it. Yes, I will catalog yeah, because, it. Be, because you'll never you'll never have a dialogue with another human being, especially in the world of entertainment, that even knows this shit. Much no, I you. learned so much from your in interview with Joe Rogan. Both of them, actually. Hello, I'm just a guitar player, but I but the brain works. <laughs> it does. It does. <laughs> you you destroy people in debates. I mean, it's it's crazy. It's it, it yeah, it is crazy. Um, it's crazy because I I actually wrote Wang Dang Sweet Poon Tang and I meant it. <laughs> Why should the author of Wang Dang Sweet Poon Tang intellectually tower over the Pierce Morgans of the world who the other side thought he would be, be the guy, the smartest, most educated guy, a cocky limey, witty beyond measure until he ran into Uncle Ted and I ripped his head clean off and <laughs> shit down his neck. It was, it was like, like a ballet of the middle finger army. Beautiful. Point being is that the left, the Democrats, the liberals, they only presume to know. They want clean air, soil, and water, and none of them have planted tens of thousands of trees. Fuck you. There you go. There you go. Have a nice day. Drive safely. Do you have to get going? Yeah, you got it. You got, you got no, to no. Oh, okay. it's, a figure, it's a figure of speech once you've completely slammed the door on people. No, I, I, I like, and I like those discussions. I like debates. And um, I'm never I, mean. I'm never, I'm never oh. nasty about it. I mean, I was so polite to Pierce Morgan. I thought he was going to kiss me. Um, but he had the you on time, again, so he must have. Yes, I, I, you, you lob presumptions at me out of the park. I knock him out of the park because I actually have hands-on, boots on the ground, diverse experiences on planet Earth. And, and I'm, I'm humbled beyond measure to genuflect at the altar of truth, logic, and common sense and the evidence to support it. So if you're going to debate me, you're going to lose. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Would you have a debate with Neil Young with that whole Spotify thing? That would be kind of a fun debate to see. And then you guys could have a concert afterwards, do it for charity or something. It would be awesome because he's he's farm aid. I'm the farmer. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. But here's the Chuck. Here's the beauty of that. Absolutely, I would, and I would be polite and I would respect his incredible talents and how he has enriched people's lives. And I know he's been a doper forever, which is why he oftentimes doesn't make any sense, and he overreacts before thinking because the more dope you smoke, the, the less you're capable of meaningful thought. Um, but I would be polite and supportive. I mean, even with Joe Rogan, everybody's going, you know, he, he's, he's, uh, he doesn't believe in things you believe. But we're, it, it was a love fest. It was, it was a love fest, not for Joe and Ted, but for topics, observations, the reverence of evidence to support your take. And, and, and everybody, that's why the Huffington, that's why the Rolling Stone magazine had a claim that the worst homophobic song of all times was Snakeskin Cowboys. Now, let's take a deep breath. What the fuck did the song Snakeskin Cowboys have to do with homosexuality? And they wrote it. They wrote that I'm the biggest homophobic punk in the world because of my, my anti-gay song Snakeskin Cowboys. What the fuck does snakeskin cowboys have to do with queers? <laughs> it has nothing whatsoever to do with that. Or how about that they write, I, I adopted a nine-year-old to have sex with her. What was her name? What? Well, he dodged yeah, the no. draft. No, no, I didn't dodge the draft. All well, he's, stuff is he's just the Native Americans. It yeah. made it lie after lie because they know they can't debate me it's so beautiful i would kiss myself well yeah because one thing that i thought was interesting i didn't know this uh in 1968 you guys did a a, a concert for the tr a tribute uh, after the assassination of martin luther king chuck thank you for bringing that up because that is also not true it's not i would, ha I would have but it never happened i don't really? know where they get this stuff and believe me i remember everything yeah, no, I, I, that's why I brought I it up. 
people on my Facebook, I get on every day and it's just an orgy of memories and outrage and fun and rock and roll minutia. And they'll, they'll mention a concert. I, I saw you Kickapoo Creek and I went, yeah, I wore that black fringe outfit and I swan dived into the mud pit and became covered in mud right after BB King. I remember I, we opened up with a song called Loaded for Bear. I remember everything because I've been clean and sober and the brain still works. Plus, those memories are really valuable. Yeah. I, I won't mention any names, but a bunch of A-listers. Come here, Coco. <laughs> here's, here's my inspiration. Look at that beautiful. Oh, that's one of your dogs. Yeah, you got yeah. three, right? Yeah, I got three. Happy Stadium, Coco. But anyhow, A-listers, the most revered musical geniuses that walk the earth. And I'm not going to mention any names. Just pick your favorite. They don't remember anything. I remember doing hundreds of concerts with this A-list band, and we'll get together and talk. I'm, I'm being generous with the term talk. They don't remember any of it. I remember all of it. And fun stuff. But that's always been my prime motivation to be clean and sober, because when I when I jammed with Jimi Hendrix or with Eddie Van Halen or anybody, I thought we could talk about music and guitar tones and maybe strings and amplifiers or girls or songs. Couldn't, couldn't. I, I wanted to have a conversation with Bon Scott. They were recording Highway to Hell. I was recording Weekend Warriors. They couldn't talk. There's, they were drooling and stumbling and puking and, and just disgusting. John Belushi invited, he drew, sent a limo for me in seven in 1979, sold out two nights at the Chicago stadium. And he was a big fan. So he and Aykroyd sent a car for me and my girlfriend to come to their, their speakeasies that they bought while they were filming now uh, the blues brothers, which I was just, oh, John Belushi, man, I consider myself funny, but that's my man. Yeah. I, want to, I want to meet John Belushi. And he's sending a car for me. I can't wait to shoot the shit. And maybe, maybe do some jam sessions of funny shit because he's that, that kind of spontaneous guy. Right. Chuck, what a heart, another heartbreak. It, huh. it was an outtake from St Scarface. Nobody could form a syllable. They, were a, they smelled like a dirty diaper. They, nobody could talk. I wanted he and I, the uh, Belushi and Aykroyd elevated James Brown and, and Booker T and the MGs and Stax Volt and Steve uh, 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 Cropper and, and Duck Dunn, all the all my musical heroes. I thought we have so much to talk about. And they were they wanted me to jam. I couldn't wait to play. I could play the uh, soul man like perfect like I learned from Steve Cropper I couldn't wait to get in with John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd and the guys and go I couldn't wait yeah. they couldn't stand up Ugh. it was like an outtake <sighs> of clockwork orange cuckoo's nest opium den spoof and that happened all the time with all these heroes and you you motherfuckers what are you doing and i actually i said john you're gonna die you can't do this like, john ah fuck mm. Jimmy, no, bad. I don't know. I don't need your. I don't know what those pills are, but I don't sure the fuck don't want it. He's gonna kill you. I told Jimmy Hendrix he's gonna die. I told John Belushi he's gonna die. I told Bon Scott he's gonna die. I told Keith Mooney he was gonna die. <sighs> and I, I, Nugent doesn't party. Oh, I party, but not with drugs or men. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I so I don't need any more graphic uh, lessons than than the. The, the the people who were weak and made mistakes taught me. I, I, I so, so wish, I mean, I think Eddie Van Halen died because of substance abuse, weakening in his system and smoking. And I told him that. In fact, I was the first phone call. He told me that when he went to rehab and got clean and sober, he said, you're the first phone call I'm making. I want to thank you for pushing and never giving up on me. Cause I always told me you stupid fuck. What are you doing? <laughs> uh.
So, so I got a lot of lessons in life and, and I try to uh, learn something every day. And then if it benefits my life, pr- liberty and pursuit of happiness, I try to share it with people that seem to be stumbling because we all stumble. But if we have lessons that can minimize the stumbling, I think it's up to us on a spiritual level to share those lessons. And that's what I've done, which is one of the reasons the left hates me. Ah, Nugent wants to ban dope. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> and Nugent's against alcohol. Well, I'm against drooling. I'm against <laughs> puking and dying. I'm against mothers around a hole in the ground crying because their son got high and is dead. That's what I'm against. So abusing it. Yes, obviously. But I, I got, I got to tell you, um, you know, Keith Richards, notwithstanding, <laughs> he, he's got, he's got Monsanto beat. Um, you know what Monsanto is? I no. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Better living through chemistry. Yeah, he should be there. He should be on their poster. But anyhow, I spent the weekend with Keith Richards in '78 um, at Studio Fifty Four. Chuck, dang, put your thinking cap on. Wouldn't you have loved to have followed me and Keith at Studio Fifty Four in Manhattan? What? Yes, that sounds Talking amazing. Talking about a dichotomy. That's like God and Satan on a date. We're not, <laughs> he's not Satan, but you know what I mean? But the dichotomy the is dichotomy, like- dichotomy, absolutely, yeah. Two totally different people. And we had a great people. time, but he, could, he couldn't carry on a conversation. Huh. It was a series of noises and an occasional <laughs> syllable. <laughs> and, he, and the fact that I was carrying a Walther PPK 380 kept him fascinated. He always, always wanted to check and see if I still had my gun in my belt. You um, brought your gun to Studio 54? Hello, <laughs> I carry my gun to the fucking bathroom, Chuck. Uh, I have a handkerchief. I don't leave my handkerchief outside Studio 54. A handkerchief, a knife, a belt tool. I got chapstick. I got a lighter. I got a flashlight. I got a pistol. I got 48 rounds of ammo. What's that? What else? I got guitar picks. There's certain things I never leave home without. Yeah. So you're hanging out with Keith Richards and he's just fascinated by your gun. Yeah, he, we were at a, a banquet. It was like a beggar's banquet outtake. Hmm. It was, uh, um, uh, geez, I'll try to remember all the people. Johnny Winter, Edgar Winter, um, uh, Rick Derringer, uh, Eddie Money, um, Bill Graham put it on because I just sold out Madison Square Gardens two nights in a row. And Keith Richards and uh, 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 Britt Eklund. I can't believe I remember all these names. Britt Eklund. Remember Britt Eklund? No, who's that? That's uh, a famous blonde actress that... Uh, um, now, now one name evades me. I don't know why it evades me, but the singer with the first Jeff Beck group that went on to make all those hit records. Come on, Ted. Ooh, I'm trying to blank too. Uh, yeah. The, the English guy with the spiky hair, just a phenomenal talent. Um, but anyhow, it was his girlfriend, famous actress, babe of the rock and roll world. She was all over me that night. Anyhow, <laughs> um, we're at the table and, and Keith had just the previous year been busted. I think down in Tennessee being caught with a pistol. And he was so he loved guns. Who doesn't love guns? And uh, they he, he was facing felony charges because he's a foreigner with a pistol without a license and a permit, as if we need a license or a permit for a God given right. I'd like to punch the prick that thinks he, he, he can give me permission to defend myself. Who is this motherfucker? Um, so he brought a cane with a big brass knob on it. And he always had that cane with him. You can see footage from back then. He always had the cane. And I had mentioned to him that, you know, he played a huge role along with Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley and Lonnie Mack and Dwayne Eddy. I just said, I want to bore you for this all your life. But one of the reasons I'm a dangerous guitar player is because you 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 passed on the baton of all those black heroes. Thank you for that. I, I played every one of your and Brian Jones's lick all my life. That's what the Amboy do. He went, I appreciate that, man. I think that's how he said. I could hardly understand. But he had the cane. I said, so did you ever get out of that? Uh, gun charge in Tennessee. And he goes, yeah, difficult. I think he was saying, yes, it was difficult, but that fascinating. Um, what's Mike Myers does a fascinating version. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't know if I was talking to Keith Richard or Mike Myers, but anyhow, it was awesome. <laughs> you can imagine how easily I'm entertained, but I'm entertained by the best. Yeah. I was expecting Richard Pryor to come in and ignite his Afro. Cause that's the ultimate entertainment. <laughs> he made a career out of it, but anyhow. Um, oh. So, and he, he, he said, yeah, but I carry this now. And he handed me the cane and he, he smacked it in his hand and I, he handed it to me. 
And we're sitting at this bigger banquet with all these stars and all big, big night and all this food and there's the carved ice swan and really a, a beggar's banquet, rock and roll, post-concert orgy. And a, Carlos Santana was there. Um, I think I named everybody. And uh, um, he handed it to me. And I said, yeah, it's great. That's got a lot of heft. That could do some damage. That's awesome. And we're sitting at the table next to each other. And I say, but uh, if somebody came at you uh, 10 feet away, this would probably come in handy. And I handed him my Walther and he grabbed it. And you could, all of a sudden he went. Shocked face. Shocked. Because Manhattan, you can't carry a gun in Manhattan. Right. Uh, so they say. Yeah. Um, but I'm a free. Let, let me make sure I clarify. I'm a free man. Guess who's in charge of my uh, survival? One person. Me. I don't need a piece of paper or a license or a permit for my first amendment anywhere there's no building where my first amendment isn't good i don't need a license i don't need another man to go you know here's some areas you have a first amendment but over here you don't have any fuck you so that's my attitude about all my god-given rights i don't need any man to authorize my right to keep and bear arms or defend myself in fact if anybody dares they are clearly the enemy of my life. So I have all my God-given rights as I walk on planet Earth, including when I tour Europe or Britain or anywhere. I've always been armed. I've always got a, I just have stuff. I have guitar picks. I have a handkerchief. I got a wallet. I got ID. I got some cash. I got my driver's license. I got my my sheriff credentials. I've been a sheriff deputy for 39 years. I wasn't back then, which I finally passed the law house resolution 218 so that all sworn law enforcement can indeed carry a firearm in oh. the United States of America. Duh. So he was absolutely fascinated that I'm at this big table with all these celebrities in New York City and I handed him a loaded Walther and he clung to me like glue all weekend. It was just <laughs> awesome. So yeah, there's some fascinating stories in the naked cities and all the best ones are mine. That's a great, that's a crazy story. Keith Richards. Yep. Oh, I can't believe he's still, he's still kicking. He's still doing fun. Somehow he's. God bless him, huh? Yeah. Where I got to tell you, Chuck, what he did to pass on those black masters soulful licks it's not more important than the black masters soulful licks but he elevated and emphasized what chuck berry and bo diddley primarily so many others but primarily those guys in the black emotional defiant musical authority of the newly electrified guitar i was born in 48 i think les paul electrified it in 44 45 right around right around the time of nagasaki what a coincidence um and uh what the stones what brian jones and keith richards and certainly george harrison um john lennon not so much because he's mostly a strummer which is awesome um but how they transferred the cadence, the lyricism. For, for example, do, I, I'm, I'm the only guy who celebrates and promotes and, and, and just rejoices that on the first Stones album and the first Beatles album were Chuck Berry songs, Bo Diddley songs, and Motown songs. Hello? And they better delivered it than those like like Elvis did. I think they better delivered it in a dedicated, intense reverence of those black authority founding fathers to better convey it to the world. Um, and it, it doesn't matter. I, I see if I remember. I knew all those licks. I yeah. Mean, yes. Get out of here. 
here. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. So, so the Stones and the Beatles, they're revered and they're celebrated, but they pe people don't articulate the specifics of what Keith and Brian and George brought us from those original black heroes because there, there, there is no meaningful music ever. Meaningful mean that, that prods you, that, that motivates you, that drives you in an uppity, you can't not pay attention to it, that wasn't created by a black guy. Uh, the Hollow Wolf, the Muddy Waters, the Mose Allisons, the, the, all those original, you know, agonizing blues artists, agonizing because they were tortured with the worst curse in the history of humanity, slavery. I'd love to meet a man that thinks he can own another man. Um, but they were a victim of that. So their heartbreak, we will never know. We can contemplate it and dedicate ourselves to understand it. And thank God we eliminated it. Um, but coming from shackles to free at last, I give you Chuck Berry. Mm. <laughs> That's why that is so powerful and so meaningful. And the Stones did such a beautiful job of revering, representing, projecting, and, and delivering that Black authority. Because you got to admit, uh, the Stones and the Beatles, they were tight. They, the music had such spirit because of their Black influence. Case closed. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, and they influenced so many other bands. Then it's like your generation, and then the 80s, and then it just keeps going. It's eternal. Um, just like it, that ad lib moment in Stranglehold. Some people got want to get high. Some people got to start low. Some people think they're going to die someday. I got news. You never got to go. I had never said that before. When I was doing the rough vocal track to show the lyricism and cadence and the melody to Derek, because he has such a superior voice for that kind of song, um, just before the bolero erupted, I just said it for the first time. And, and uh, just, uh, all the guys uh, thought it was cool, so we kept it in there. But that's really what I'm saying is if you put your heart and soul into being the best that you can be, whether you're a welder or a teacher or, or a radio guy or a guitar player or an artist, if you deliver the goods, they'll last forever. When we're long gone, your spirit exists in that music. We got Meatloaf. We got so many artists that have passed. Um, that music will live forever. Thank God. Bon Scott's music, Dirty Deeds, Done Dirt Cheap. That would be played forever because it's authoritative, passionate, outrageous, defiant, uppity, and, and deeply uh, uh, spirited, dare I say. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much. For, I know you probably got to get going. I went way over the time limit. Uh, but I appreciate it all the time. This has been a blast. So I, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Ted. You're very welcome, man. The new record, we're proud of it. Jason yes. Heartless on drums, Greg Smith on bass guitar. I'm the luckiest guitar player that ever lived. I've got the best bands forever going all the way back to the Amboy Dukes and the Damn Yankees and all my solo bands. But right now, when Jason and Greg and I attack these songs that I ejaculate, um, they, they put just superhuman energy and piss and vinegar and musical authority into every song. We're so proud of the record. Have you, you've heard come and take it, which is awesome. Wouldn't an American campfire. What, yeah. Yeah. It wouldn't matter what the, to the topic was. It's just a great piece of music, just great rhythm and grind. But have you heard American campfire yet? The second. Yeah. Single? That one and come and take it. I heard those two Detroit muscle coming out soon. And then you're going to tour as well with these, uh, with these great musicians that you have. Yeah, who's going to stop me? I can't wait. In fact, there's a great, great statement being made down in Panama City. The uh, city elders, uh, though none of them are as old as I am, I uh, hope they respect their elders, uh, they decided to make a statement of sorts. See if you can uh, decipher the statement from Panama City on April 29th, where Ted Nugent is headlining the Beach Bash. And then on the 30th, Kid Rock is headlining the Beach Bash. I think there's a, I think there's a statement in there somewhere. Where they hire that sounds like a fun concert. Yeah. Are Super you coming problem. to Listen, Phoenix? Are you coming to Arizona? You know, I, I haven't seen it on the list yet. Okay. You know, the communist Chinese in the White House uh, canceled our 20 and 21 <laughs> tours. 
and hopefully we can uh, <laughs> stomp the shit out of them. And uh, uh, hopefully we can unleash the beast this year because we love the music. We can't wait to play the songs. We I made a list out the other day of the favorite songs I'd like to play, and I think it was like 120 of my favorite songs. Um, I love my music. I can't wait to play this stuff. I play my guitar every day. Jason and Greg put their heart and soul into every lick, every song, every night. So we're the last of them. And if you want to see a fire-breathing, high-energy A10 warthog of rock and roll, I'm your daddy. All right. I'll come and see it for sure. That sounds like a blast. All right, Thanks man. So well, much. God bless you. I appreciate you letting me talk about the things I love, man. Yeah, me. I love listening anytime. Thanks so much. Live it up, man. Have a wonderful, wonderful year. Clusterfuck 22. Yeah, you too. All right. Okay. Well, that was a whirlwind, uh, but we got through. Ted is kind of like the Tasmanian devil of rock, and uh, I had a lot of fun. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And again, even if you don't agree with him, you can't deny he's an interesting guy to talk to. Uh, make sure to check out his new album, Detroit Muscle, and catch him on tour with his band. Uh, you can also follow both of us on social media. And if you enjoyed this episode, uh, please hit the like button and give the show a good rating or review so that we can combat the trolls who will probably give this episode a thumbs down or a bad review. And uh, I appreciate all your support that helps the show grow so that we can get great guests like Ted Nugent. And thanks again for listening or watching. Make sure to subscribe so that you can catch future episodes. Have a great rest of your day and remember to shoot for the moon. 